All right, good afternoon. Um, not that you all don't know this, but for our viewers, uh, uh, as soon as I'm done here, uh, Ambassador Vasily Nebenzi, a permanent representative of the Russian Federation, uh, and Ambassador Bassam Sabag, of the per permanent representative of the Syrian Arab Republic, will be here to brief you, and uh, Paulina will not be briefing today. Another programming note, tomorrow at 9 a.m., uh, there will be a virtual briefing here um, by the resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator at Interim for Syria, El Mustafa Ben Lamli, and he will be joined by the regional coordinator for the Syrian crisis, Muhannad Hadi. They will brief you on the humanitarian situation on the ground following um, the earthquake. Um, and then at noon, I'll be joined by uh, Adam Abdel Mullah, the resident uh, humanitarian coordinator for Somalia to brief you on the launch of the Syrian, uh, excuse me, of the Somali humanitarian response. In fact, Fahan will be here tomorrow. Um, moving, obviously, on to uh, the situation with the earthquake. Bup, 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 bup. Uh, quite a bit for you. Um, in response to the multiple uh, earthquakes that rocked southern Turkey and northern Syria yesterday, the UN annou we announced a $25 million grant to help kickstart the humanitarian uh, response. Uh, the funds from the UN Central Emergency Response uh, Fund uh, will help provide urgent life-saving assistance to the region. Uh, Martin Griffiths, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, says he wants to ensure the people that they are not alone uh, and that the humanitarian community will support them every step of the way out of this crisis. On the ground, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that our UN disaster assessment and coordination teams are in Adana today and mobilizing to Gaziantep tomorrow to support Turkey's urban search and rescue teams. For its part, the UN Refugee Agency says among those affected inside Syria are families that were already displaced from their homes by the country's long-running uh, crisis, living in tents, flimsy shelters, and partially destroyed uh, buildings. In Turkey, those caught up in the disaster include many thousands of refugees from Syria and the communities that have generously hosted them for nearly 12 years. Syrian refugees make up more than 1.7 million of the 15 million people inhabiting the 10 provinces impacted by the earthquake. Right now, UNHCR is providing with other UN agencies what the Turkish authorities are asking for. That's basically kitchen sets, mattresses, and tents, so that agencies can complement the leading efforts of the Turkish authorities to rescue Turkish citizens and refugees in the same manner. In Turkey, efforts are also currently focused on search and rescue, and UNICEF is coordinating with the government and the Disaster and Emergency Management Presidency on the emerg emerging needs linked to the wider humanitarian response. The support will include hygiene kits, blankets, and winter clothes. Some 57,000 Palestine refugees are also being impacted uh, by the earthquake uh, in North Syria, and that includes Aleppo and Latakia. UNRWA teams are already providing medical and non-food items. Um, in terms of UNICEF's response inside Syria, the immediate focus is on ensuring that affected children and families have access to safe drinking water and sanitation services, critical in preventing illnesses in the early days of a crisis. UNICEF's response focuses on child protection. This includes uh, ways in which to identify separated and unaccompanied children and work to reunite them with their families, as well as providing children with psychosocial first aid. As to education, schools in Turkey and parts of Syria have now been closed for the next week, and many temporarily house the affected and displaced children and families, which will obviously have a knock-on impact on the continuing, the ability of authorities to continue educational services. There are a few medical supplies uh, and trauma kits in Damascus, and UNICEF is seeking to fill immediate gaps for all supplies, including um, medical supplies via the agency's closest warehouses, which are those in Lebanon and Jordan. UNICEF has also sent emergency supplies for operating theaters, along with nutrition supplies and high-energy biscuits. The displaced population in Syria needs food and essential nutrition services. UNICEF is coordinating with nutrition response with UN agencies and partners, mobilizing essential nutrition supplies 
from across the region and delivering essential health and nutrition services through mobile teams. For its part, UNESCO has undertaken with its partners an initial survey of damage to heritage sites. In Syria, UNESCO is particularly concerned about the situation in the city of Aleppo, which is on the list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. Significant damage has been noted in the Citadel. The western tower of the old city wall has also collapsed, and several buildings in the souks have been weakened. Um, moving on, uh, just a couple of notes from here. Uh, as you heard, the Security Council today heard a briefing from Izumi Nakamitsu, the High Representative uh, for Disarmament Affairs on the implementation of Resolution 2118 regarding the elimination of chemical weapon program of the Syrian Arab Republic. She expressed her sincere hope the council members will unite the, on this issue and show leadership and demonstrating that impunity in the use of chemical weapons will not uh, be tolerated. They also heard from senior officials in the OPCW. Um, I have a statement on Mali, which is a just more formal uh, note on what happened uh, earlier this week with our colleague. The Secretary General deeply regrets that on February 5th, the transitional government of Mali declared the director of the Human Rights Division of the UN uh, Peacekeeping Mission and representative of the UN High Commission for Refugees, uh, Human Rights, as person on non grata. In the context of the political transition towards a return to constitutional order in Mali, the Secretary General underscores the critical need for the Malian authorities to respect, to protect human rights and include in particular freedom of expression, which is crucial for the functioning of a democratic society. Um, trip announcement, a delegation of senior UN officials made up of Assistant Secretary General for Africa, Marta Pobi, the Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support, Elizabeth Spehar, Assistant Secretary General for Rule of Law and Security Institutions, Alexander Zwev, and the UNDP uh, Assistant Administrator and Regional Director for Africa, Ahuna Eziakonwa, will travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo from the 8th to the 12th of February. The World Bank and representatives of the uh, Office of the Special Envoy for the Great Lakes will also join the delegation in Kinshasa. The visit will serve to ensure coherence and alignment of UN initiatives and integrated support to national peace-building priorities with a particular focus on disarmament, demobilization, reintegration, and stabilization. On a related note, uh, the head of the peacekeeping mission in uh, the DRC, uh, Bintu Keta, condemned the violence uh, during yesterday's demonstrations in Goma in North Kivu province, including looting and vandalism which resulted in the collapse of a church which killed two and injured at least four people. She called on all communities to refrain from using hate speech and inflammatory statements. The mission also raised concern about the continued difficulties in ensuring that aid can safely reach people in need, particularly those displaced in the M23 controlled areas. Um, and as we are told that the situation in the eastern part of the DRC remains tense uh, as protests are um, continuing if turned violent. Uh, also, our efforts to resupply one of the UN peacekeeping missions bases, the one in Kinchanga, which is uh, pr currently protecting about 500 civilians who sought shelter there, or continue to be hampered. Uh, this weekend, a convoy that uh, had to turn back in Sake due to hostility by the local population. A uh, couple of quick notes. A new report launched today by UNDP says the hope of finding work is the leading factor of driving people to join fast-growing violent extremist groups in sub-Saharan Africa. Among nearly 2,200 interviewees, one quarter of the voluntary recruits cited job opportunities as their primary reason for joining. That's a 92% increase from the findings of the same report in 2017. Nearly half of the respondents cited a specific trigger event that pushed them to join violent extremist groups, with 71% pointing to human rights abuses, often conducted by state security forces, as the tipping point. Um, the UN Environment Program today released a report which says that to reduce superbugs, the world must cut down on pollution created by the pharmaceutical, agricultural, and healthcare sectors. UNEP says the same drivers that cause environmental degradation are worsening the antimicrobial resistance problem that could cause up to 10 million deaths by 2050. Uh, the report is online. Um, and 
on a roll. Two more member states joined today. Um, both members of the European Union, both start with the letter S and both are monarchies. Spain, yes. A, San Marino is not a monarchy. It, second, it is not a member of the European Union, and yes, it is Sweden. Phew. So I'll go You're first. going back to Berlin. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Steph, what can you say about um, humanitarian access, particularly in northwestern Syria, given the uh, statement by the ambassador after his meeting with the SG yesterday that all humanitarian aid that goes into Syria needs to be funneled through uh, Damascus? Uh, what is the situation in terms of access right now? Well, the situation, uh, I mean, continues to be challenging. It was challenging before. It continues. It is obviously even more challenging. Uh, it is even more challenging um, now. Um, we will continue to use uh, the Bab al uh, cross-border, uh, uh, cross-border. Um, let me try it again. Cause I'm, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just... <sighs> Sorry, I'm, it's been kind of a crazy morning, and I have too many papers here. Yes, 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 yes. That's not what I'm looking. I've. Let's do take two. Yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, in all, in our seriousness, so we continue to use uh, the Babalwa crossing as uh, the transshipment hub is actually intact. However, the road that is leading to the crossing has been damaged, uh, and that's temporarily disrupted our ability to fully use it. Um, we also have the cross line uh, option. Uh, the last deliveries, I think, cross line were around the the eighth and ninth of January. Uh, we are working on doing another cross-line shipment in the coming days as soon as, um, as possible. What I can assure you is that we, will res we have always and will continue to respect the territorial integrity of Syria, and we will also respect the mandate given to us by the Security Council. Michelle. So when you say... Um the road's damaged, but you're still trying to use it. Like, mm -hmm. how can you give us an indication of how much aid is getting through that cross-border crossing? Um, how quickly can the road be repaired so it can be fully put to use again? Right. And with regard to cross-line, you know, the SG's regularly reported to the Security Council how challenging that is, that it's just a sort of complementary to the mm -hmm. cross-border operation and that some of the challenges are receiving the... Necessary, necessary and timely security guarantees from the parties. Has that changed in the past two days? Are you getting more cooperation? Well, I mean, listen, I, I think the, there's still a lot of chaos, right? And people are spending a lot of time trying to uh, do immediate search and rescue, uh, trying to find loved ones. Our operations have also been impacted, um, given that we have staff that live in the, in the, in the area. Um, the Secretary General, I think, had a very good meeting with the Syrian uh, permanent representative uh, yesterday. And I have no doubt that all the parties involved uh, will do their utmost to facilitate uh, the transport of humanitarian goods to all Syrians who need it. Uh, on, the, on the road issue, I need to, I need to check. So, uh, cross, you know, you said you're working on getting another convoy mm -hmm. cross line. Like... This is an emergency situation. You know, I, I, right? It is an emergency situation. We still, I mean, uh, it's an emergency situation which we're fully aware of. Uh, it doesn't take away the need to ensure that things are done safely and also to give time for people to also, I mean, we, it, as I say, it's a chaotic situation. Things, people also need to, to recover. We will move as fast as possible. I know the Syrian authorities are moving also as fast as, as possible. There's goodwill on all sides. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're dealing here with uh, a, a catastrophe on top of a humanitarian crisis that already existed.
Uh, Pam and then Deji, and then we'll move. Uh, just on a follow-up to that, has the Secretary General reached out to Syria, Turkey, Russia on adding cross-border or cross-line deliveries? Uh, I'm not aware of any discussions on that at this uh, at this point. Deji? Uh, my question is also about the earthquake. Uh, since we know that Turkey and Syria both are heavily impacted by this earthquake, uh, we know that the cross-border uh, center yesterday you mentioned is actually in southern Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would this, because we know both countries need huge mm -hmm. humanitarian support and, and supply, how, how would the UN allocate those, those, those you know, uh, supports for, for both countries? Like, is that enough? Well, I mean, we will, as in any humanitarian crisis, we will allocate resources based on needs, right? Uh, I'm sure that in the coming days, uh, we will see a flash appeal. We still ongoing needs assessment missions are still ongoing to try to figure out exactly what is needed for the, uh, for the immediate future. And, and uh, I just talked to my producer in Damascus um, three minutes ago. Uh, he wa he's now in Aleppo. He said it's a disaster there. And sh he showed me some photos and said there's no enough fuel for heavy vehicles for the rescue. There's no enough workers there. Um, to put this simple, do you think this is an opportunity? First, for both, us, both the, the, the par all parties to settle down and really to reach something in, in common. And second, do you think it's also a, an opportunity for international community to, to at least really think about give temporary allevi alleviation of the sanctions? Look, this is an opportunity to put politics aside and to focus on what is needed urgently to help men, women, and children whose lives have been devastated uh, by one of the most serious earthquakes we've seen in a long time. Um, and we hope that everyone will keep that in mind. Uh, Edi, and then Bitua, then we'll go. Uh, thank you, Steph. A couple of questions. First, um, have the staff, the UN staff on the ground in northwest Syria um, reported on um, damage estimates, casualties. Um, we've heard what you said was most needed. Secondly, um, is Martin Griffiths planning to go to the region and will the UN be coordinating humanitarian aid in Turkey, Syria, or both? Uh, well, let's take, take it uh, uh, separately. On, on Martin, as soon as we have something to announce, we will share that with you. Uh, we will do whatever the government of Turkey wants us to do and try to be as helpful as possible to them. Uh, I think the, the, the government, uh, the Turkish authorities are uh, well-versed in dealing with these types of emergencies. Sadly, it's a country that has undergone a lot of earthquakes. So we are there to support them. Uh, we will do whatever coordination uh, they want us uh, to do. Um, the situation in Syria obviously is slightly different uh, given uh, the fact that we're dealing with zones under government control and zones under non-governmental uh, control. I think all those issues of coordination should be made clear in the coming days. Bay tool. Um, oh, sorry. Yep. Um, and on what the, the UN staff on the ground is reporting from the Northwest. They're they're reporting what what you're seeing on television, which is parts of of the area just utterly destroyed. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I think the, the 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 videos that we're seeing, the pictures that we're seeing, tell tell the story. Our, our colleagues are not telling us a, a different story. Uh, Betul? Uh, thank you, Steph. I know that the UN has an assessment team on the ground, mm -hmm. but can you please tell me if uh, the UN has any search and rescue teams on the ground, and if yes, how many? And also, has the UN started any aid operations delivering humanitarian aid? Yeah. Because there are 
people uh, sleeping, they, they had to sleep outside under freezing temperatures. They need tents, uh, coats, um, uh, food, water, and also a follow-up on Michelle's question. When the SG met the Syrian ambassador yesterday, did he propose uh, if uh, they would allow any other border crossings from Jordan or Iraq or any other places? Um, uh, we know uh, that they want cross line, yeah. but did the UN propose? Uh, I don't have anything to share with you on that uh, on that second part. Uh, on the first one, as I mentioned, you know, our UN agency are already distributing. Uh, key material, I think UNHCR and UNICEF, in southern Turkey in support of the authorities. Yvonne, did I get you? Okay, that, let, me, let me just go to Yvonne. No, hold, hold, hold on, Yvonne, go ahead. I'll, Thank I'll you. you. Um, again, on the Secretary General's meeting with the Syrian uh, permanent representative yesterday, did he suggest uh, that, the, that the Syrian uh, permanent representative don't, doesn't make political capital out of this in terms of uh, trying to force all the aid to be funneled through Damascus. It's not the Secretary General's um, style to tell permanent representatives what to say or how to say it. Uh, we we will do uh, we will do our part. Um, I think they, the, the the Syrian ambassador. I think as he as he mentioned it asked for the UN's uh, support uh, as we've been. Uh, for years now, the UN will continue and be present for the people of Syria. Can I ask on the closure of the road, which is apparently temporarily closed? Mm -hmm. Any timeline on that? No, when I'm trying to get some open? information on uh, trying some information on that. Uh, Presumably, if the road's closed, nothing's getting through. It's damaged. I didn't say it was completely closed. So we're, okay. I'm just trying so to get like more gr granularity on. Okay. How it can be driven. And has, has, does the UN have any concerns about aid, cross-line aid? I know there's been, there, there hasn't been a lot of cross-line aid deliveries over the past year or so. Um, can you remind us about the problems, well not the problem, yeah, the challenges that the UN faces doing cross-line deliveries and are there any concerns about aid diversion by the government? On the on cross line, uh, I think the last uh, the, on January eighth, we we delivered more than five hundred and sixty seven metric tons of uh, of humanitarian goods. It was the tenth cross line uh, convoy uh, since uh, twenty twenty one, and the fifth since uh, July of twenty twenty two. The challenges that existed before uh, are well known and well uh, well reported on. Uh, I don't have any specific information about uh, on the latter part of your question. Pam and then Abdel Hamid has been very patient. Oh, everybody's yeah, been quick, very patient. Uh, <laughs> a quick follow up, Mar Mark Lowcock, who you know well and knows these uh, crossings well, said this morning that because so many victims may be in non-government controlled areas, that a diplomatic effort must be made to get these crossings open. As I said, we're, I, at this point, we've got the crossings that we have. Uh, if, that, if there's any reports I can share with you on changes, I will do that. Abdel Hamid and then Ms. Salome. Thank Just you, Stefan. During the tsunami of 26 December 2004, the UN asked former President Clinton to lead the humanitarian right. efforts. Is the Secretary General thinking of something like that to appoint? I, 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 I mean, you, you and I were there. This was not done 48 hours after the earthquake. So I think uh, there, there are certain steps to be uh, followed. Um, obviously, uh, a, a um, an appeal uh, will be launched uh, shortly, and I can assure you the Secretary General will do whatever he can and whatever he needs to do to ensure uh, that this humanitarian crisis gets all the attention uh, that it needs for the sake of the millions that have been impacted. Uh, Ms. Salome and then Ephraim. <laughs> it's just a follow-up. If there were 10 convoys cross line since 2021, so in two years, by comparison, how many were coming uh, cross border? More. A lot more. A lot I mean, more. Th that's in, I mean, I can find you the numbers. It's in the reports, but a lot more. 
Yeah. Michelle, I'm sure, knows. Uh, Ephraim. Yeah, okay. Almost everyone asked all the questions that so, I spent all morning preparing. But oh, so, <laughs> no but, bitterness there. Yeah, but yeah. when you say there's goodwill on all sides, yeah. does that mean um, there is hope that maybe we can see all the parties that are making war in Syria, uh, Russians, US, Turkish, to name only a few? are go probably going to put enmities aside now to let the humanitarian I, listen, I, I, operation? I, I, I don't have as much, I don't have a crystal uh, ball, but I think what we see uh, in terms of the in immediate international reaction coming from so many different countries, um, it, it does give us hope in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the ability of people to put their differences aside. What impact that will have on the political uh, situation, I, I cannot predict. We have seen crises in the past in different parts of the world where following a natural disaster, it kind of unlocked uh, or unblocked, shall we say, uh, the path to a, political, uh, to a political settlement. You, you know the area better than I, I, I not, not, at least I can't predict it, um, but I think we can all be heartened uh, by the international response that we've seen, uh, that we've seen so far. And a quick follow up on the SG's meeting with the Syrian PR, you called it a very good meeting. The Syrian PR was very clear when Michel asked him yesterday if they would allow aid um, or more crossing and he said all aid should go through the government. Uh, in Damascus, we all know what that means. So, what, what does that? Uh, what was very good about the meeting? It was a very frank meeting. Uh, to some, uh, just a few follow-ups. So, uh, the aid you send through the cross-border, do you have then also to coordinate with uh, with Damascus, or uh, we use the same the same procedures? I mean, it has. I mean. We have a mandate uh, given to us by the Security Council. We follow those uh, uh, those those procedures. Which do I, you I, have? I can to find give you the details, but that hasn't. I mean, we we continue to operate today under the same mandate that we operated last week. Okay. So and uh, then um, other con I mean, only the aid that you have to bring through the cross border that needs to. Uh, Okay, let me paraphrase. If countries want to send aid through uh, to Syria, uh, through the cross border, or through the Turkish border, uh, to the areas where um, opposition, uh, under the control of the opposition, um, they are not, they don't have to coordinate with uh, Damascus. I think it's, we're, we're, there are two different things here. I, the, the operation, the cross border, is for UN assistance, right? I cannot speak for bilateral assistance. So the, the, what may or may not go through, th okay. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Under control of the opposition, um, they are not, they don't have to coordinate with uh, Damascus. I think it's, we're, we're, there are two different things here. I, the, the operation, the cross border, is for UN assistance, right? I cannot speak for bilateral assistance. So the, the, what may or may not go through, through that crossing that is not UN, I cannot speak to that. Okay, just last thing. Uh, so who's coordinating the, the efforts in Syria, in North Syria? Uh, the, um, the person will speak to you tomorrow, which is the UN coordinator, the regional coordinator. So basically, the two guests we'll have for you tomorrow morning at 9, we can speak to what's going on in the government-controlled area and the non-governmental controlled area. Stefano and then Linda. Thank you, Stefan. Um, about the Security Council meeting yesterday on Ukraine, um, the U.S. ambassador uh, gave us, again, um, disturbing uh, news about this deporting of children from uh, occupied area of, uh, of Ukraine to Russia. Uh, now, this we heard this before, but looks like it's continuing. Uh, what does the Secretary General think about um, 
this issue that I mean, is very th this is an issue of concern that has been raised by unicef it's been raised by the high commissioner for for human rights and we share those concerns Ms. fasulo thank you steph yeah, yeah, yeah. my question has to do with uh, rescuing people as well as food um, is the UN or any organization planning or doing perhaps airlifting people or dropping food and that kind of thing? I don't know if it's possible. I, I think all those, you know, all, all those options are on the, on the table. Um, I think right now most of it is coming in by road. This is also a time of extreme bad weather. Um, but I think the, the concern, and this is why we need, this, we need the needs assessment missions to, to finish, is the, there may be parts of, uh, north, uh, of Northwest Syria that we're not getting to, that we haven't yet to get to. Um, and I think the same can be said for probably for Turkey as the Turkish authorities try to get to everybody who needs help. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, as we heard that uh, the uh, roads on the cross borders has been damaged severely by the earthquake, uh, so the, the equipment cannot go through. And uh, based on that, do you think that the United Nations has based a solid plan to make a rescue, um, to rescue those people on the north of Syria as soon as possible, as every second we are losing life there? and nobody can rescue them. One more thing, you mentioned uh, uh, a minute ago that uh, the United Nations has the control on the cross borders and you cannot speak for other countries. In this case, is if other countries are willing to help uh, the uh, North uh, Syrian, uh, Syrian people, is that will be possible? And within the sanctions that happening from the United Nations, from the United States, uh, how can that be arranged? Okay, I mean, on... Uh on Syria, you know, we have, um, we have about 400 UN staff members that were there before. So they are working to assist uh, in the best possible way the local population. As I mentioned yesterday, there were some supplies that were pre-positioned in the area that are being distributed. Um, do they need more help? Yes, that is clear. Uh, we're trying to get some more information on the on the road uh, on the road itself, and as soon as we have something, uh, we will share that with you. Uh, on the bilateral aid, I, I can't I can't speak to that uh, at, at this point. Okay, Michelle, and then oh sorry, yes, go ahead. One more. Hi, Stefan. I'm James from Ashark, and we don't have people on the ground at Bab el Hawa, as far as I know, but. I, I'm confused about the Bab al-Hawa crossing in terms of what I believe you said, that the roads are blocked and therefore the aid is being disrupted. But the, the New York Times, as an hour ago, they're quoting World Food Program officials as saying that Bab al-Hawa is intact, but it's not functioning. That, that's what I said. Okay, I, so what, I, what I said, because right. I'm always confused, so I'll just read it as well. Uh, Bab al-Hawa crossing and the transshipment hub is in intact. However, the road leading to Bab al-Hawa is damaged and has temporarily disrupted the cross-border response at present. Uh, Michelle. I'm off topic. Okay. I just want you to give us big picture here. When a, a, a humanitarian disaster of this magnitude happens, right? what happens in an international humanitarian community that is already stretched to its limits? There are only so many donors. I mean, it's 4.6 billion in Afghanistan. It's so many billions in Ukraine. I mean, where does the money come from when catastrophe strikes in this fashion? Well, we have to, we are already stretched. We're going to stretch ourselves some more. The money is there, right? I mean, <laughs> there is a lot of money in this world. Um, we're going to need more people to give more money to help the millions and millions of people who've been impacted. The way the system is set that is that every time there's a humanitarian emergency, we have to go out, hat in hand, asking for money. We will do that. We will do that with passion, and we will do that with urgency but we will need people and member states to pony up. Michelle. Okay, so um, first of all, I think we'd all appreciate an email this afternoon with an update on the road. Yes, I, I, I got that, <laughs> thank you. Um, and then off topic completely, following on from the SG speech yesterday on his priorities where he reiterated his 
thoughts on um, social media and misinformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elon Musk has responded, saying the UN is more likely to cause rather than prevent disinformation. What is your response to that? My response is that social media companies have a responsibility for what is posted on their platforms, and they should be held accountable. And I think the Secretary General has been very clear on that. We have seen very worrying trends on social media uh, platforms recently with disinformation on climate, pushing out uh, hoaxes and deliberate uh, disinformation um, in the face of what is an urgent and unquestionable climate crisis. Has the Secretary General reached out to Elon Musk? Would he like to meet with Elon Musk to discuss further? Not particularly. Uh, but we're always happy to have, to have meetings. Uh, um, Abdel Hamid, I'm sorry. And then I think we'll ask Ambassador Nibenzia to come up to rescue me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. One on, there was a meeting in Oman yesterday, I think. In? Oman. Yeah. About extending the ceasefire in Yemen. Do you have an update on the ceasefire in Yemen? I, I do not have an update. Just to say that while there's, no form, there's been no formal extension, we are, uh, we have been, we've not been witnessing any uptick in fighting, or serious fighting. Uh, and and the, the gains that have, uh, that led from the ceasefire, notably the flights, uh, the humanitarian shipments, uh, have, have held up. But we'll try to get you an update. Yeah. One more question. Yep. Uh, is there My response is that social media companies have a responsibility for what is posted on their platforms, and they should be held accountable. And I think the Secretary General has been very clear on that. We have seen very worrying trends on social media uh, platforms recently with disinformation on climate, pushing out uh, hoaxes and deliberate uh, disinformation um, in the face of what is an urgent and unquestionable climate crisis. Has the Secretary General reached out to Elon Musk? Would he like to meet with Elon Musk to discuss further? Not particularly. Uh, but we're always happy to have, to have meetings. Uh, um, Abdel Hamid, I'm sorry. And then I think we'll ask Ambassador Nibenzia to come up to rescue me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have two questions. One on, there was a meeting in Oman yesterday, I think. In? Oman. Yeah. About extending the ceasefire in Yemen. Do you have an update on the ceasefire in Yemen? I, I do not have an update just to say that while there's, no form, there's been no formal extension, we are, uh, we have been, we've not been witnessing any uptick in fighting, or serious fighting, uh, and, and the, the gains that have, uh, that led from the ceasefire, notably the flights, uh, the humanitarian shipments, uh, have, have held up. But we'll try to get you an update. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Uh, Israeli new government has imp uh, introduced new punitive measures against Palestinian prisoners, including canceling family visits, uh, closing what is called kitchens in, inside the prison cells, and preventing them from going out on a break every, more, every day to see the sun, and others. I don't want to go into uh, details. I, I Do you have that. any? I will, I will ask our, our human rights colleagues in the, in the region for some information. Thank you. Stefano, and then I will escape. Yes, Stefano. Is a follow-up on my question before, because I, I'm not really satisfied with your answer. Um, yeah, they say... I, I don't rate your questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, because at the point is this. Um, the Russian denies that those children have been deported, but there are about 700,000... Apparently, there are 700,000 children that from Ukraine are now in Russia. The Russians say that these are, those are refugees, war refugees. The Ukrainians say that many thousands are, uh, have been deported. Now, um, because I didn't find the Secretary General on this specific issue, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I didn't see him intervening in this. You have been saying that UNICEF and others organization are monitoring, so I'm saying, wouldn't it, because it, this is, it looks like it's a is a big, big question, right? Are those children being deported or not? Shouldn't, uh, uh, is it, 
how the UN is uh, really investigating this and is the Secretary, uh, well, I mean, is the Secretary the, General the, the going the to take who, position? The people who hold a, a portfolio on this, whether it's UNICEF, the High Commission for Human Rights, the High Commission for Refugees have opined on it. The Secretary General fully shares uh, their concern and their worry, and he has nothing to uh, uh, he has nothing to add to what's already been said at this point. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll send you the information for tomorrow's briefing at nine a.m. Uh,